welcome to this week's episode of High Altitude Garden Series. I am Monica Pless, I'm the Farm to School Director with Guidestone Colorado, and we're here in our new geodesic dome greenhouse, um, talking a little bit about seed saving. We would be outside, but it's been pretty windy today, and seeds have a tendency to just blow away when we set them up, so I decided we'd move here into the dome greenhouse. So. I'm going to talk sort of a little bit about a very introductory bit about seed saving. Um, I'm going to show you how to save a couple of seeds or seeds from a couple of crops that are fairly easy. We'll talk a little bit about why some crops are harder to save seeds from, and then I'll leave you with some resources to go more into seed saving um, through a couple of organizations that are here locally, um, a couple of local and amazing sort of regional and national seed companies that I like, and um, just ways for you to explore this more in the future. So to start off, I'll say, why would you want to save seeds? So we try and really save seeds from some of our crops that we want to get more and more adapted to our local um, conditions and, and um, we're here at 7,000 feet. We have only about 100 frost-free days a year. So those particular conditions and the fact that we get relatively little rain um, makes it really great for us to save the seeds of the crops that are working really well for us. Um, you can also decide that um, just like Gregor Mendel, that you want to have taller peas so that they're, you don't have to bend down for, to pick them, and that might be something that you're selecting for. So you're specifically trying to save seeds from the tallest peas you have. Or you want to, might want to save seeds from lettuce that doesn't bolt in the summer heat. You might want to like flag a lettuce that hasn't bolted, hasn't bolted, hasn't bolted, put a little flag next to it, and then let it go to seed finally and then save the seeds from that is something that might do well for you in a really hot and dry summer like we have here. There's lots of different things that um, are sort of genetic characteristics that you can breed into your plants generation by generation to make it more likely that they have those characteristics that you desire. Um, one thing I'll say right off the bat is that a lot of people ask me about the difference between heirloom seeds and hybrid seeds. So heirloom seeds are varieties that we've kept um, for over a hundred years. So, um, of course, I didn't bring this over with me, but um, one example is like a Cherokee purple tomato. It's sort of a deep, like dark pink tomato with green shoulders, and that has been a fairly consistent tomato for years. If you save a Cherokee tom purple tomato seed, you'll get a Cherokee purple tomato. It's very consistent in what it gives you. You can save seeds from hybrid plants, but this, for example, is a delicious tomato. It's a um, sun gold cherry tomato. It's an F1. That means that it has two parents that get crossed, and it's the first cross. Eventually, if you keep saving seeds from this tomato, like you'll get a tomato. It'll probably be a cherry tomato. It'll probably even be somewhat like this, but it's not guaranteed to be like as sweet as a sun gold, or as productive as a sun gold, or as orange as a sun gold. Like eventually, that can fall out. So um, just know that if you are wanting to get into seed saving and you want to know what you're gonna get, it's better to use a lot of heirloom varieties. And there's a couple different um, uh, seed companies that specialize in heirloom varieties. One is Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, but a lot of the other ones will mention, you know, we buy a lot from High Mowing and from Johnny's, and um, they'll mention if they say F1, it means that it is a first generation hybrid. They'll also usually mention if it is um, an heirloom variety. Um, so a couple other places that are great, um, more local seed companies that might be good places to look if you are also in the high altitude, sort of central Colorado area. High Ground Gardens has seeds there in Crestone, Colorado. So they're probably close to 8,000 feet and pretty dry. And then Farm Direct Organic Seeds is Dan Hobbs and Nana Meyer, and they are down closer to Pueblo. I think it's in Avondale. And so they're lower, but um, they also have some great things that we have learned to save, um, and we've gotten seeds from them. So if you wanna get started on saving, but you wanna start with some things you already know are good varieties for this area, those are a couple places that I recommend. Botanical Interest is also up in um, Fort Collins, so that's another one that is a Colorado-based company that's a little bit bigger. All right, 
Um, I'm going to start out with showing us just how to save seeds from peas. Um, peas are one of those that's kind of great. They um, self-pollinate a lot. Basically, you just like, when you have a, a green pea pod, especially if there was one that you missed and it starts to get a little sad, you're doing great. Just let it get sadder. Let it get even sadder and even drier. And then when it's really nice and crispy, that's what we're looking for. With the peas, we want to like let it dry out until it's crispy and we can just break it open. And then the peas are just the seed, the seeds for the peas are just the peas. They're just come right out of the inside of the pea pod. Um, these ones might not be the best peas. I didn't pick any that were particularly good. I just picked the ones that were already dry. So you might want to flag if you have a pea plant that is doing really well um, or seems to be producing a lot. And you might put a little flag next to it and then at the end of the season when the pea pods are starting to dry out, you know you want to save some of those. Um, one of the things I like about seed saving is that um, a lot of times it pays off to be a little lazy, right? You want to be like less lazy about labeling things and saying this, I like this one. But a lot of times the way that you get seeds is just by waiting. And um, the plants, their purpose in life is to make baby plants. Those are seeds. And so if you aren't harvesting a lot of these things regularly, they will eventually go to seed. And so then you have seeds. Um, another one that I think is quite easy are sunflowers. So if you have sunflowers, and you don't pick them all to be um, flowers and flower bouquets, then eventually they'll start to um, they'll start to harden off in the middle. And then usually the way I find them is I look at which ones it's like looks like somebody's already started eating it. Oh well, yeah, those critters they usually know when things are ripe even before I do. So I just am going to take this sunflower. I'm going to literally break it apart. This one is still a little soft and tender, I would probably do better if I waited for it to be a little more dry, but I can move it apart and then you can sort of see in there those black seeds, they're sunflower seeds. These aren't the biggest sunflower seeds you've ever seen, you know, the ones that you get at the, at the gas station or something are also probably bigger. So that's another example of something you could be trying to breed for. If you wanted to pick your tallest sunflower, you could save the seeds from that. If you wanted to pick, um, the one that had the biggest seeds, you could flag that. Um, you might need to cover it with something to protect it from all of the other critters that also like big seeds. Um, beans, you would save the same way that you save peas. You just let them dry out on the stalk and then um, you open up the pod. And one thing you can do is you can like grind it all up all together or you can put them all on a big tarp and thresh it where you hit, hit them so that that dry outer bean pod breaks off. And then you can winnow it, which you could do with blowing yourself or with a fan and you're like sort of tossing those. And the beans will be the heaviest and so all those little pieces of dried out pod will blow away. These are a beautiful kind of bean called scarlet runner beans. They um, grow up things, they're a pole bean, so that you can trellis them, and they have really beautiful bright red flowers. Um, and then they're also a great cooking bean, so you can um, put these in a garden just to look nice. Um, you can put them in, we have ours in our three sisters garden with the corn and the squash, and also the sunflower, the secret fourth sister. Um, but we can also take these and cook them um, after we've saved the ones that we want for next year. Um, you can see that like both the places where we get our seeds from, when we get them in packets, if we save them ourselves, um, we want to put them into something that is, we want to make sure we put them away when they're quite dry. So, um, you, you know, out here that's not usually a problem. Sometimes other places I might put, um, you know, I might put a little bag of rice in or I might just make sure that it's spread out on a, like one surface so that it really can dry out. Um, because we really don't want them to mold. So we want to keep the seeds when we're storing them away from light, away from heat, and away from moisture. And I would say probably the most important is moisture. Um, so we put them into, we put ours into brown paper bags and we'll label them. Um, I'll label them with the year. Some seeds, many seeds last longer than one year, although their germination rate starts to go down slowly. So um, if you're using older seeds or if you're using seeds you saved yourself, 
and you're not quite as confident in um, did I do everything right, you could do a germination test. And that would mean putting out a wet paper towel, starting your seeds on it, seeing, keeping it moist over time, and then seeing, okay, if I put out 100 seeds, what percent of them germinated? And um, any seed company that sells a seed is required to send away for some, a third party to do a germination test to confirm um, what their germination is. Um, if you have seeds that have a low germination rate, you can always overseed. Um, and you, know, you might end up with lots and lots of beans and have to go back and thin them, but that's one way to make sure that they come up. Okay, we'll talk about a couple others that are really easy to save. So one of them is marigolds. So I try to pick a marigold that has sort of all the stages of flower. So we have this bud that hasn't opened yet. We have a couple of really nice, juicy, beautiful looking flowers. And then we have a couple of flowers that are past their prime. So usually if I'm trying with cut flowers to keep them going and keep making cut flowers, I'll try and deadhead everything. That just means once it's past its prime, it's gone. But when I'm trying to save seeds, it pays to be a little lazy, and so I've left this one on. You can hear probably that it's already a little crinkly, and literally I'm just gonna grab the, all this off the top, and I'm gonna pull off the bottom, and that, those are all my marigold seeds. So um, you can see flower seeds are often really light. They're very easy to save. We do a lot of seed saving of flower seeds with the um, kids at the elementary and middle school garden. So for these marigolds, I'm gonna put them into this nice, paper bag. I'm going to fold it over a couple times so they don't, none of them escape. And then I'm going to label them. And I like to label exactly where they were. So I'll say these were marigolds. If I know which variety it was that I planted in the spring, I'll put that on here. Um, at this point, I don't remember. So uh, I might go back into my records and look that up and, and add this to the label. But I'm going to say that this is from the community and school farm. So these, um, this can help us continue to get um, ones that are really best suited to this place. Even though our other school gardens at the Longfellow Elementary and Salada Middle School are only a mile or two away, um, they have different conditions. This site is actually quite wet. We have a, quite a high water table here. And so I might be saving marigolds here that are better suited to having a little bit of wet feet some of the summer. And whereas like Longfellow, maybe it's in a bed that keeps pretty dry. And so it's better suited to that. Or at Longfellow, um, sometimes some of those beds, if they're made out of concrete, they might have a longer season. And so it might be better suited to something that has a little bit of a longer season. Um, another flower that's super easy to save are cosmos. So I did the same thing. I tried to pick a, a stem that has like a, um, just to show you guys what they look like. Cosmos have these really delicate leaves. They're white and pink. Um, this one happens to be white. And so it has a couple of older blooms on it. And then it has one that is totally done. This one I think might not be quite as dry. So this really might be one where I'm going to take these seeds out and I'm going to let them dry further. Really, the best place to let any seed dry is out on the plant. Um, that's, so that way it gets nutrients until it sort of shuts off as the plant dries off. It knows exactly the right time to stop sending more nutrients to that, those seeds. Um, but I bet, from my experience, these will probably, at least some of them will still germinate. So the same thing, I'm gonna put them into another bag and I'm gonna label it Cosmos from the Community and School Farm in 2020. Um, I'll label that one later. Um, just to give you guys some other ideas of things that are really easy to save, um, this is, this is cilantro. So as cilantro gets older, you know, if you look at these leaves down at the bottom, that's much more what we would recognize as a cilantro leaf. As cilantro starts to go to seed, it gets these more and more feathery leaves that look more and more a little bit like carrot leaves. And then at the top, they start making these white flowers, which then turn into little green balls. These little green balls, this is green coriander. And when they dry out, they turn into the spiced coriander. So you didn't, might not have known this, but um, 
uh, you get two uh, herbs and spices in, in one. So you can save this coriander and just put it right in your spice jar when it's nice and dry. Coriander has a little bit of a citrusy flavor. It's used a lot in Indian cooking. And, um, but you can also, these are all, each one of these is a little um, seed for making more cilantro next year. So I'm just literally gonna crunch them off and I could try and clean these up. If I was gonna run these through a cedar, I would really wanna make sure that I got rid of all the little twigs and stuff like that. If I'm gonna seed by hand, it's a lot easier. Like none of these extra twigs are gonna get caught in anything. So the same thing, I'm gonna put them into another bag. I'm gonna label it. I don't feel bad about not labeling this right now in the middle of the class because I know what cilantro seeds look like because they look like coriander. So we'll label it after class. Okay, we have two more that I haven't actually ever done before, but I think they look like we can do them. So, the first is spinach. So, um, spinach, and uh, this is true with um, lettuce also. You know, what we want from spinach and lettuce are varieties usually that don't bolt quickly. So I could save seeds from this. It's probably not the one I wanna save seeds from because it bolted. Um, but to just show you, if you were really like, you know, hard up and needed some kind of spinach seed, um, you could do it. So this is just a spinach that we missed when we were clearing out the bed. It went to seed. And if you look at it, these seeds are in these little clusters right along the stem. And um, you wanna wait again until they're quite dry. And then these ones, we're just gonna take them off. We're gonna sort of crumble them up. And again, these to me, they look a little green, but I wanted to show you where they are on the plant. And we would wanna let that dry and then we would put it into a labeled bag and keep it for next year. Um, the same thing is true with lettuce. I don't have an example of it here, but if you ever let a lettuce go to seed, it turns into a little Christmas tree with a lot of white fluff at the top. All you gotta do is grab the white fluff, put it in a bag. That white fluff, each one is um, connected. It's like, it's like um, dandelion so that it can spread its seed. But if you just want to take the white fluff off and get that, that lettuce seed into a bag, um, and if you don't do that, you'll probably find a bunch of little lettuces growing all around there next year anyway. This one is a radish. So you can see the radish formed at the bottom, and then we stopped harvesting off this bunch of radishes, and they turned into these little, the pods were green at first, and I picked the one that looked like it was the most dry, so I'm just going to open one of these pods and I'm going to crack it open and there's all these radish seeds in here. Um, now we have to be careful with some kinds of brassicas. There's a big family of brassicas so a lot of them can cross. So again, I'm not exactly sure. I haven't done radish seeds before but it would be one that I would probably experiment with and I'd probably label that these are radish seeds and try it out somewhere experimentally next year but still for my like most of the radishes I'm growing for um, uh, you know to sell to the school district or to give to the school district or to sell to the hospital I would probably still use some radishes from another source that I know and trust to have a really consistent product um, because while I feel like these will give me radishes I don't know if they are going to give me exactly the same kind of radish because I don't remember which kind I planted but you know you can there's a lot of experimentation to go also. So uh, the last thing I wanted to show you guys is how to do a wet save. So going back to these tomatoes, um, like I said, this is black plum. It's an heirloom variety that came from Farm Direct Organic Seed, Dan Hobbs down in near Pueblo. And this is an F1 hybrid. It's a, a Sun Gold cherry tomato that I think we probably got from Johnny's Selected Seeds. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna show you how to open and get started on saving seeds from one of the heirloom tomatoes. So I'm gonna choose a tomato that looks really nice. Like that's one of the things is like, oh, you know, I wanna save the seeds from a good tomato. So this was a healthy looking plant, really vibrant, had a lot of tomatoes on it, um, and it looked like a good tomato itself. So all of that makes me feel like, yeah, this is good, I wanna grow more of it. So I'm just gonna cut it in half not over my to-do list because then we'll all not know what we're doing. So, okay, we got all of our nice juicy tomato seeds. 
So if any of you have bitten into a tomato, you know that there's that gel around those tomato seeds. So what we do is we're gonna put them all, squeeze all these tomato seeds out into some water, and we're actually gonna let them ferment. And what that does is twofold. It gets rid of the seeds that aren't good, um, and the, it also helps to get rid of that gel um, coating on it. And um, so we'll let that ferment. We'll skim off all of the, if it, like there's any like mold or anything like that, we'll skim that off. We'll strain it through a strainer, and then we'll take those little newly de-gelled tomato seeds, we'll spread them out on a paper towel, and we'll dry them on the paper towel like overnight. Again, we wanna make sure they're dry. Like for holding on to seeds, like getting them dry is really important. And so if you're in a wetter environment, that might mean taking a couple days for them to dry. Um, so again, skim off any scum, strain it, dry it on a paper towel, and then um, you can rub it off the paper towel. Or honestly, sometimes I even just like put the whole paper towel on the bag um, and label it again. And that time, if I, if I am putting the whole paper towel in, I usually label it on the paper towel and on the paper bag I'm putting it in. Um, and then, you know, if you do a good job of storing these nicely in a dark, dry, and relatively cool place, then your seeds should last, um, depending on the variety, for multiple seasons. Um, you know, I've heard these stories about people finding old corn in their grandmother's garage when they were moving her out, and you know, out of a whole bucket, only five of them germinated, but they were 50-year-old corn. And so, if you care for your seeds well, they will help take care of you as well. So, what I do with my seeds is I label them like this, like the one that I labeled, and um, then I tend to put them into some sort of organization, like I'll put them into a, like Ziploc bags where like all my flowers will be in one Ziploc bag, and then that Ziploc bag goes into a, a Tupperware or some kind of mouse-proof, pest-proof container. Ideally, it would actually come and like live in like the closet under my stairs where there's no window and no light and no way for it to get very hot or very cold. Um, we have had them stay just in the shed over the winter as well because even though that goes through some temperature fluctuations, it's still dark and um, dry. So that's what I feel like are the most important. And then the last one that I forgot to talk about, oh yeah, it's chives. Chives are a perennial. They make these um, pretty puffball flowers that sometimes people use as garnish and you know they're edible. They taste like chives, so like be forewarned, they go get a little onion breath afterwards. But when they totally dry out like this, you can actually kind of look into them and you can see these little black dots in there. So those little black dots are the seeds. And I'm just gonna shake the seeds out into my hand. And um, again, this is a good place where like either winnowing or just carefully taking all of the like um, the fluffy part of the flower black back off will help us get down to the seeds. And then the seeds are these little angular black spots. So we can plant those and um, get more chives. Um, the onion family is a family that their seeds don't um, tend to last very long. It's one where I do, I'm most likely to buy new seeds every year. Um, but we did save seeds also from some scallions this year that overwintered. Um, they're a biennial, so usually you don't get the flowers until the second year. Um, but since we overwintered some, we were like, well, we might as well save some. So, um, so that'll be an exciting one for us to try next year. The chives for sure work. We've saved those before, but I haven't done the scallions yet. So I want to leave you guys with some resources. Here in town, we partner a lot with the Save Salida Seed Library. SAVE stands for Seeds Adapted to Variable Ecosystems. The seed library, it um, has its like physical um, seeds um, on site at the Copper Kettle Apothecary on F Street between first and second. And they're gonna do a bunch more workshops on some more complicated seed saving um, this fall. And I think they're hoping to have more of a seed swap over the winter or whenever they can based on COVID. Um, some of the kinds of seeds that are harder to save might be things like carrots because they're biennial, so they take a longer, you have to wait until the next year. Um, some of the ones that are the hardest to save are things like 
um, squash and cucumbers because they're insect pollinated and so you have to isolate them from any other squash. Um, you have to, if you want to like save your Uncle David's Dakota dessert squash, which is the best winter squash in my opinion, um, you have to make sure that it's not next to any other kind of squash that's going to cross with it within two miles because of how far some of our um, honeybees and pollinators can fly. So that can be a really challenging one to save. There are ways to do it, but I wanted to give you guys a couple examples of things that you might already be growing that are easy to save seed from. You know, if you already have some cilantro, just let it do its thing, and then you can like save some seed, have some coriander, and plant some new seeds next year. Um, another good resource that's regional um, and has a lot more trainings about seed saving is the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. Um, both Save Salida Seed Library and Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance have Facebook pages, and that's probably the best way to find out what um, upcoming trainings or events they're going to have. A couple other things if you're really into seed saving. Um, my friend Owen Taylor started a seed company called True Love Seed, which is out of Philadelphia, and they have an amazing podcast called Seeds and Their People. So if you're like want to hear more about seeds, especially from a lot of different um, cultural backgrounds, um, they do some really cool podcasts there. And then again, the other couple places that I recommend as um, local seed sources is High Ground Gardens in Crestone and Farm Direct Organic Seeds, which is where we got that black plum tomato. And if you want to hear a more of an interview between me uh, talking with Hannah Van Enzenberg from Save Salida Seed Library, you can go to khen.org slash a time to grow. There's dashes between that, a dash, time, dash, to dash, grow. Um, and our January 13th episode on our podcast was all about seed saving and about different things that the Save Salida Seed Library has coming up and ways that you can learn more there too. Um, good luck. I hope you guys have a great time in saving some seeds. As always, if you'd like to support Guidestone or learn more about our programs, you can do so. Um, you can support us on that link right below here, and you can check out more of what we're doing um, at GuideStoneColorado.org. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next week.